Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to All Space Considered. I am Dr. David Reitzel, and with me tonight is Vanessa Alicron, and also Alan Alt is on the stage with us tonight. And it is the, yay, thank you all, welcome. As always, All Space Considered is brought to you by Griffith Observatory, the Department of Recreation and Parks, and the City of Los Angeles. And as always, we like to thank our exclusive nonprofit partner, Griffith Observatory Foundation. And thanks to all the members out there that are supporting us as well. Um, welcome to the YouTube audience that's out there watching us stream, and welcome to our fantastic audience here in the Leonard Nimoy Event Horizon Theater. Um, Tonight, we have a fun program. We are going to do some looking forward and, well, looking back, first of all, and then looking forward. So um, we're going to look back at the, some of the top stories of 2023, and we're going to look ahead to some of the expected things in 2024. We're going to do it for the astronomical discoveries, the launches, the launches, the launches <laughs> and, of course, astronomy events. Um, so I hope you all enjoy the program tonight. Uh, first of all, uh, the theme is a little bit, like I said, looking back at 2023, looking forward to 2024. And perhaps you know what this is a statue of in the middle. This is Janus, the god, who is sort of a gatekeeper, a guard of transitions, of, of changes. So a, a good god to look at. In fact, that's why he has two faces. One is looking back, one is looking forward through this time of transition. But there's also a moon of Saturn called Janus, and that is Saturn's rings down below that. That isn't... Um, for some of you hi-fi audio people, maybe you think it's a record now that they're popular again. Um, but indeed, that is Saturn's been Janus. This was taken by the Cassini spacecraft, and it's about 100 miles across, a little bit longer in the longest direction, a little bit shorter in the shortest direction. So a rather small moon, but um, I just thought it was appropriate to, to show you a picture of that. I'm going to start out with some of the top JWST, some of the top web um, discoveries and things that were done. The Webb Telescope, of course, observes in the infrared. And if you go up to our exhibit, Beyond the Visible, that would be the one, let's see, this one here, sort of the second from the left, um, or no, the third. The second from the left is microwave. The third is infrared. And we even have an infrared camera up in our galleries up there that you can go see yourself in infrared. It's fun to rub your foot on the floor and make a warm spot. And when you move your foot, you can actually see that spot glowing in infrared radiation. It's kind of cool. And that's what the Webb Telescope takes images in. In the depths of space, the Gunther Depths of Space, we actually have our superstar projector. You can see it there in the background showing the latest um, Webb images. So make sure you check that out when you come to Griffith Observatory. Well, one of the most spectacular ones was Jupiter. The, this release was really incredible. You're seeing the planet itself glowing. The warmer areas are glowing brighter. The cooler areas are darker. And in this image, the great red spot is sort of white, and you can see how it disturbs that entire latitude going across it. There's lots of swirls there. On top of it, there's a little bit of an invisible feature that is a jet stream going right across the center of Jupiter. And that jet stream was never seen before, so that's a new discovery from the Webb Telescope. Wow. Here's another planet in our solar system, and you might not recognize it. This is the planet Uranus, and it is a ringed planet. Maybe you didn't know it, but like Saturn, it has rings. And these rings glow very brightly in infrared light, and it's because they're reflecting sunlight. They're made of ice, and they're very good at reflecting the sunlight, so it glows really brightly. And the planet itself has ice crystals and methane and things like that that also reflect the, the sunlight a little bit better than Jupiter does even, which is why it's so darn bright. In that bigger wide field image, a lot of the moons were captured too. You can see Oberon, Umbriel, Titania, um, and then the inner ones that are a lot smaller. So in Miranda's down at the bottom, it's also a large one, Ariel and Miranda. So uh, it's capturing the moons too. Didn't just observe planets, of course. This is what's known as the Ring Nebula. The Ring Nebula, you can actually see with a small telescope. Um, it's in our skies, it's, near, it's in the constellation of Lyra, near the bright star Vega and it's labeled as M57 there. It's one of Messier's objects. He was a comet hunter that cataloged these things so he didn't go get them confused with comets. And today, they are some of our favorite things to look at. Uh, people go Messier hunting, as it's called, and we'll do whole nights where you try and get as many of these objects in the telescope as you can. Um, back to the, the Webb telescope image, you don't see this when you look through a small telescope at it. It looks a little like a smoke ring. 
here we're seeing incredible details. And when we go to the longer wavelength shot, we're seeing even more of those strands that look like they're blowing out from the center. Indeed, this is the outer layers of, sun -like the star, of a, a star like the sun that puffed off its outer layers as it died. So you are seeing sort of a slow motion, not really an explosion, but a slow motion dissolve of the star as it blows its material away. Now this is the result of an explosion. This is what's known as the Crab Nebula. In 1054, a star appeared in the skies. The Chinese noticed it. Europeans didn't notice it. We're not sure why, but they didn't, no record of it was taken. But the Chinese saw this new star. And when we go look at the location they recorded it, we see this remnant. It's known as a supernova remnant. It was a giant star that exploded. Um, here is another one, Cassiopeia A as it's known as it's further away than the last one, about twice as far, about 1,100 light years away. And it would have been seen in the 1690s, but nobody seems to have recorded it. And we're not sure why. Maybe it was a little too faint. Being twice as far away, it would have been four times fainter than the Crab Nebula explosion. Um, so who knows? But in any case, we are seeing a, uh, another supernova remnant here from a giant star that exploded. Now, it's not all just dying stars. We have stars that are born, too. And this is a star forming region. This is the Orion Nebula. It is the middle, well, star, quote unquote, but really it's the middle nebulosity in the sword of Orion. I don't have the constellation here, but I'll leave that to a exercise for the, the viewer. <laughs> um, but the cool thing about this study was they were looking for small brown dwarf objects, maybe free floating planets and they found 540 of them floating around there. Now, they were Jupiter-sized. They were uh, roughly 13 Jupiter masses, so 13 times more massive than Jupiter, down to a little over half of a Jupiter mass. Um, completely crazy, 9% of these were in doubles. Now, getting double planets like that that are free-floating, they aren't around any star, is really hard to do. They have to form that way together or in be some really weird system. You tend to eject single planets. You don't eject multiples. And the Orion Nebula is young. It's not old enough. We'd expect to have a lot of planets ejected from their, their stars. So this is a weird result. We're not sure how this happened. They must have formed this way. We have work to do to figure out how these things formed. So one of my favorites. So I guess I should, could have turned it sideways for you so you can actually see that some of these are doublets. When you look down below, you can see the two right next to one another. Um, so indeed, they are doublets. Another type of object that's involved with stellar birth, these are known as herbig hero objects. And they are jets of material coming off of very young stars when they form. When the material flows into the star along its equator, material shoots out the poles, actually. It's complicated physics, and it took a long time for people to model this and get it right. But an astronomer, Herbig, and another one, Harrow, at the same time, started seeing these things and cataloging them. Herbig worked here in the 1940s. Um, so he actually did this work later when he, when he was a, a researcher. But here he is at our famous SICE-12 telescope right up on the roof. Um, Vanessa, did you know that uh, we had someone like this that had done research and worked here in the 40s? So I did hear about that. He did take pictures, right? And he, he said, that's not my office, but <laughs> <laughs> it could have been. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I don't get to see the, you know, where he hung out. But Yeah, yeah um, indeed, that's the dark room. And I read that when he would miss the last bus, he would sleep on the concrete floor there. So um, some things, well, I shouldn't say some things don't change, but I do know. I don't there, do that. You don't do that <laughs> these days. But sometimes there's things like eclipses and other things where we'll be up here getting ready. And if the eclipse starts at 3 or 4 AM and we just finished getting ready and it's midnight, there's, there's no point in driving home and coming back. So we just stay up all night. We don't get to sleep on concrete like, <laughs> like he did. Yeah. Um, uh, of course, the Webb Telescope also <laughs> took some deep space images. Um, this is the El Gordo Cluster. This is a giant cluster of galaxies. And these weird straight line you're seeing in the middle, kind of crossing in the middle of the image there, that's actually a gravitationally lensed object. That's a galaxy that's behind the cluster. And as the light from that galaxy passes through the cluster, the gravity bends it. Um, enhances it, it brightens it, just like a, a lens would do, or a telescope gathers more light. And that galaxy has been re-imaged several times in this same picture we have here, so we're able to see it. Now what's cool is that light going across there is a galaxy, when the universe was about 700 million years old, we think, it's a spiral galaxy, and it's about a quarter the size of the Milky Way. And we're seeing what's called quenching happening down in the center of it. The center is not forming stars as quickly as the outer part. 
again, predicted in galaxy formation, and we'd never seen this before. Now we're having to see it through this weird gravitational lens in order to get enough light to do it. But this is the strength of looking at clusters like this. They're like a telescope in between your telescope and what you're studying. It's a, an additional way to, to enhance the light. Exoplanets, of course, were a topic of study by the Webb Telescope. Those are planets orbiting other stars. And um, we have our exhibit, Other Worlds, Other Stars, in the depths of space, the Gunther depth of space. And you can see here, last year, 5,275. That was on January 1st. January 1st, 2024. Let's see what it says here. Did I go forward or not? Nope. Oh, I did. Now we're, now you, I blew it there. I, I, <laughs> I ruined it. You all saw what was happening. Well, let's run the video again. Is it going to run? No. Here we go. That's the last one. Okay, no. It's so slow. Yeah. <laughs> 5,566. Yeah. So 5,566. So 291. Now you might think, why? Well, I remember the Kepler Space Telescope days where we were getting thousands every year. Why is it only 291? Well, the TESS uh, exoplanet Explorer, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, has 7,000 candidates. It has a whole bunch of stars that they've seen dips as the planet passes in front of it, make, blocking out a little bit of the light. But they want to confirm it. Maybe it was a star spot, like a sunspot, but a star spot on that star. Maybe it was something else. They want to make sure these are real exoplanets before they announce them. So I think this year we could start to see a lot of them announced. And now for three of my favorite exoplanets, this has the catchy name of TOI 700E. <laughs> um, I know we're doing great with these names, but there are so many of them. There are over 5,000 of these, as you see. We can't come up with names for them all, but this one's neat. It's 95% of Earth's size. It's probably, well, it's in that zone where it might have liquid water. If it has the right kind of atmosphere, it could have liquid water on the surface. And who knows? So this is kind of an exciting one for us to, to pay attention to. Maybe there's life on it. Here's one that's bigger. This one is, oh, I'm trying to remember the size. If I remember, it's something like eight times the size of Earth. Um, 8.6 times as massive as Earth. They found organic molecules in the atmosphere. That's things like uh, ammonia and things like that. It has a hydrogen-rich atmosphere and probably an ocean underneath of water. So again, a different kind of planet than Earth, but if it has water, maybe there's life there. There's also some interesting compounds that have been seen in the atmosphere of it that, that people are excited that maybe life could make them. I'm not 100% convinced, but when those astrobiologists get to work and write their papers, then I'll report it to all of you. So interesting planet to watch. That one's K2, by the way. I backed up. It was a Kepler one. Um, this one here is WASP-17b. It has a really, really weird atmosphere. It has quartz nanocrystals in the atmosphere. Now you think quartz, did it get blown up from their like, dust storms? No, they formed in the atmosphere. The atmosphere has so much um, basically silicon vapor and other things that are up there forming these quartz crystals. Um, the volume of this planet is seven times bigger than Jupiter, but its mass is only half of Jupiter's. So it's a giant puffball. This is like a giant puffball out in space. So a really, really weird planet. Um, I, I just like it. Excellent planet. It's going around another star, but I, I think of them as planets. So those are my favorite ones. Um, you know, it's, it's neat stuff. Now to look forward, what do we have going on here? Well, one of the things that's happening is the, the Vera Rubin Observatory will open. It has an eight meter mirror and it's going to do surveys. It can get a very large chunk of the sky in each image. It has a wide field of view as it's called. And we've been waiting for this to open for quite a, time, quite a long time. It was previously being known as the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope because of all the surveys. Well, why did they name it after Vera Rubin? Vera Rubin was an amazing astronomer. She um, is seen here working at the 36-inch telescope at uh, Kitt Peak down in Arizona, and she took spectra of spiral galaxies, and she was able to measure how fast the outer parts were rotating, the stars were moving. They were moving faster than we thought maybe they should be. There wasn't enough matter to hold them in place. It's like if you tied a rock onto a really, really thin thread and you swung it around your head, you'd expect that thread to break and the rock to go flying. Well, but what if it didn't? You'd say, well, what is that thread made of? Is it carbon fiber? Is it magical? So they looked at the galaxies she had studied and there's just simply not enough matter there to create the gravity to make this stuff fling around that fast. And this is the evidence, a lot of the evidence for dark matter in spiral galaxies. She was responsible for that. So a really amazing astronomer. She continued to observe at Kitt Peak and Sarah Tololo throughout her long career. Um, and she celebrated by naming this observatory after her. 
honestly, she she should have won a Nobel Prize for this work. Um, yeah. So anyway. Ancient galaxies so massive they break modern co cosmology observed with JWST. I'm looking forward to us solving this in 2024. This is one of the things I think there will probably be enough observations. We'll start to poke holes in this. Uh, my belief is we're seeing very bright galaxies in the early universe, and they're assuming the stars that are in those galaxies are similar to the ones that are in nearby galaxies. And then, yeah, you'd need a huge amount of them to make it that bright. But if you make lots of supermassive stars that are really, really, really bright, you don't need as many of them. You don't need as much mass, and you can make a really bright galaxy early on, and you don't have to break cosmology. So we'll see if I'm right. We'll see if that's the case. There are some papers coming out that they're hinting that that does work. We'll see whether the observations play it out. And then um, one of the final things I'm excited about is the fixing of the expansion rate of the universe. The, there's two different ways to measure it. We all know there was something called the Big Bang. All the galaxies seem like they're running away from us, and it could be explained by the universe all getting bigger. Well, if you measure the nearby galaxies, you get an answer that says they're moving away at a speed of about 74. If you look at the afterglow of the Big Bang itself, you can actually get another measurement of this number that's independent. It's a different way to measure it, completely separate. It gives a number about 67. So they don't agree. And the error bars, as you can see in this plot, they don't overlap. So there's no way to say, well, these people are just a little bit high, these people are a little low. There's just not a way to solve it. I'm hoping sometime in 2024, we're able to get some ways to solve this and figure it out, because this is known as the h knot tension or the Hubble tension, and you'll hear about it. I recommend folks just come to Griffith Observatory, see our Samuel Ocean Planetarium show centered in the universe, and you can learn about our thoughts of where we are in the universe, where we're placed in it, and also how it got here. There's a great scene where we um, do a little bit of a big bang and the galaxies go flying and stuff. It's, it's good fun. So come on here to do that. So that's what I think is going to happen in research. There'll be a lot more. It's hard to predict um, astronomical discoveries, of course, but um, it'll be an exciting year and you can come here to All Space Considered for it. So, Absolutely. So Alan, what, what do we have for uh, rocket launches? All right. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you, Dr. Reitzel, for inviting me on the show this, this month. Oh, you're welcome. Thank yeah. you for being here. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here with you and Vanessa. Now, um, you know, Dr. Reitzel, that I grew up in Miami, Florida in the 80s, and I was actually able to see NASA um, launch shuttles from where I lived. But did you all know that here at Griffith Observatory, we could, this is sometimes a great place to watch rocket launches from right here in Los Angeles. Um, so take a look at this. So this is a view from Griffith Observatory of a rocket being launched called Firefly Alpha. Um, this footage was um, captured by Griffith Observatory's telescope demonstrator, Anthony Perkick, on September 14th, 2023. What you're seeing here is the stage separation and ignition of the second stage, which is taking its payload up into orbit. Now, there we go. The reason we could see rockets being launched here from Griffith Observatory is because we are not too far away from something called Vandenberg Air Force Base. There's a rocket launch pad there, and um, Vandenberg is about 140 miles away from Griffith Observatory as the crow flies, or maybe in this case, as the rocket flies. Drum roll, or, you know, rim shot there. <laughs> we often see launches from Vandenberg from companies like SpaceX, Firefly, this is the launch of that Firefly rocket that we just saw footage of. It's a mission called Victus Knox, and the purpose of this mission was not only to put a payload into low Earth orbit, but also to demonstrate a rapid response um, ability. This launch set a new record for launch time. After receiving orders from the newly formed United, Sport, United States Space Force, Firefly loaded this payload, put it on a rocket, got it out to the launch pad, launched it into orbit all within 27 hours. And that's a, that's a, a record by far. Now this launch actually had a connection to All Space Considered, the show. The spacecraft itself was built by a Boeing subsidy, subsidiary called Millennium Space Systems. And Dr. Reisel, yeah. you actually visited um, Millennium Space Systems last year, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Uh, I interviewed the gentleman on the left there, Tim Barrett. Uh, he actually used to work here for the observatory with the Laserium shows. He's an engineer and now designs satellites. And we interviewed him back in the April show. If you want to hear that or see what we talked about, you can check out the April show. Yep, on YouTube, right? Yeah. Great. Another launch we saw, not here from Griffith Observatory, but in 2023 was the launch of the Psyche mission. You see an image of it here. Psyche was a NASA mission launched on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket back in October of 2023. This launch happened from Kennedy Space Center out in Florida. 
Psyche is a mission that's headed to a metal-rich asteroid out in the asteroid belt. Um, the, the name of the asteroid is the same name as the mission, Psyche, and it's planned to reach its final destination, that asteroid, in 2029. Now, this is an extremely important mission. As I mentioned, Psyche is metal rich. It's actually most likely the exposed metal or the exposed nickel iron core of a young planet that was forming in the solar system and was destroyed early on. So studying this object will perhaps allow us to, to better understand how our solar system formed. Now, this was not the only launch we saw from SpaceX. In addition to four other Falcon Heavy rockets that went up last year, we also saw two attempts of SpaceX's newest, star, um, newest vehicle called Starship, which was the largest and most powerful rocket ever built to date. This is the first integrated flight test of SpaceX's Starship back in April of 2023. Now, remember how I said that space, or Starship was the largest and most powerful rocket ever built? Well, NASA and SpaceX weren't quite ready for that. I don't know if any of you saw what just happened, but we'll take a closer look. You see that, that what's going on there? I'll, I'll highlight it, but that object that's circled there in red is a piece of the launch pad. The, the rocket was so powerful that it destroyed the launch pad underneath it, and massive pieces of concrete went flying up in the air, and this caused a lot of damage. Um, if you take a look at the rocket being launched here, you can see not all of the engines are ignited due to that damage that it caused. Now, this ultimately led to the ultimate um, destruction, the untimely destruction of Starship, and you're about to see that massive explosion here in just a they second. They seem so happy with their chariot. They do. <laughs> and it's spinning out of control. It's not, but that's not supposed to be happening right now. And here we see it explode. Now, Elon and SpaceX are definitely not known for their tendency to give up, so they tried again. This was in November of 2023. This is the second integrated flight test of Starship. This launch was much more successful. They learned a lot of lessons. As this rocket goes up, you'll see here in just a second that all of Starship's 33 engines successfully ignited this time. There was no damage to them. And we're going to see here the hot stage separation and the ignition of the second stage take place here. So much more successful already than the first. Now, unfortunately, there was uh, some of those engines did start to fail. And the first stage met its demise here in a beautiful explosion that we're about to see. The second stage continued on, and it made it all the way almost to its final destination of low-Earth orbit. Unfortunately, um, it also met some failures. The abort system took over and destroyed um, th that stage. Now, this was what was supposed to happen when, when things weren't going right, so it was much better than that first launch because that first launch was spinning out of control. The abort system never took over like it did this time. So even though it was destroyed, it was more successful, and they're getting there. We're going to see um, another launch of Starship probably in February of this year. Now, speaking of this year, there's a couple big missions that I wanted to highlight that we're looking forward to. The first one is in October of 2024. NASA is finally going to launch its long-awaited Europa Clipper mission. Europa Clipper is going to be traveling to Jupiter, and it's going to be arriving in 2023. And I know the video is skipping, so I apologize, but... What's going to be happening is the purpose of this mission is we are going to be studying one of Jupiter's moons called Europa in great detail. Now, Europa harbors the conditions for what could possibly support life. Europa is an ice-encrusted moon with a massive liquid water ocean beneath its surface. And we know that here on Earth, anywhere there's water, there's life. So by sending Europa Clipper to study this icy, watery moon, we may be able to support future missions that could hopefully find that life if it actually does exist. The final mission that I wanted to highlight today, though, is a mission called HERA. It will be launching also in October of 2024. HERA is a mission that's a follow-up of another mission that launched in 2022 called DART. And I don't know if any of you remember DART, but DART was a mission that's... Um, DART is short for the Double Asteroid Redirection Test. DART smashed its, uh, its spacecraft into a moon of a binary asteroid system called Didymos and Dimorphos. And the purpose of this was to demonstrate that we could successfully deflect and change the trajectory of an asteroid that could potentially be heading to Earth to save, to save us. We know that DART was successful. In fact, it was so successful, the, the trajectory changed more than we, than we thought it would. So Hera is, he is heading um, to that system. It will be studying this double asteroid system in greater detail, measuring the mass, 
mapping out the impact area and measuring exactly how much we were able to change that trajectory. So a lot of great missions to look forward to here in 2024 that I'm yeah. excited about. So yeah. when, will it arrive there? when will it arrive finally? In, in 2030 or okay. 2029, I apologize. Yeah, so 2029. it'll take a while to yeah. get there, but that's neat. Yeah. One, one thing about Europa, if anybody's interested in it and is curious about the potential for life, you can see our very own planetarium show in the Samuel Ocean Planetarium, Signs of Life. So come on up here to Griffith Observatory. Check it out. Um, we have scenes that are involving this this sort of stuff. I don't want to ruin the show for anybody, but uh, come on up and check it out. It's a great show. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for that, Alan. Um, I you. appreciate you sharing all of that. On that note also about Europa, uh, Europa is out in the sky right now with Jupiter. So if you want to look, look at Jupiter <laughs> and see Europa around it, uh, you can actually go to one of our telescopes. Uh, we have a few on the lawn and also one upstairs, the big Zeiss telescope, uh, which kind of brings me into my section here. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about all the astronomical events that happened this year, but back to our Zeiss. Uh, I went back to see, or we calculated how many uh, people actually looked through the telescope. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, and <laughs> we found out this year, 2023, oh, 119,258 about wow. uh, people actually looked through our telescope. So that is about right for what I estimated a few years ago. And I was like, hmm, if we had made it to about 8 million in 80 years, how many people are looking at it every year? So uh, pretty cool. We're staying pretty consistent. So. Uh, yay for the Zeiss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is the most looked through telescope in the world. So, all right. Mm. So, um, we had, did have also some special events. So, it wasn't just every night looking through the Zeiss. Uh, we, in January, saw the occultation of Mars. Uh, so, this is when the moon went in front of Mars and it disappeared. You couldn't see it anymore. Uh, so, here's the first part of that. Uh, it's a GIF, so you can't see it. Sorry, GIF. <laughs> so, you can't see it. I don't want to start a debate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, but yeah, so you can actually see uh, Mars as it blinks just behind the moon. Uh, pretty cool, it disappeared. Um, and it came back, don't worry. Uh, so on the other side, uh, you can see it coming back out. And I really love this because you can actually see the disk of <coughs> Mars there as it comes back out. So right there, there it is. Mm -hmm cute. Um, and we also have uh, not just the occultation of Mars, but the occultation of the rival to Mars, which is a star called Antares. So this one went behind the moon as well and came out the other side to here, which you can see. So it also came back. Thank goodness. Um, yeah, so that was in, uh, this one was in, uh, as you can see up there, August. So yeah. And then we also had a partial solar eclipse here at the observatory. Mm -hmm. uh, it was about 70%. We watched it. We got up early, all gathered at the observatory, had a little event. Uh, here you see an image of the sun being eclipsed, uh, being uh, reflected onto the building. Pretty cute. And also our coelostat caught a nice image of it. This was not at the maximum, but still pretty close. And Alan, this, this is the telescope you were using, right? Yes, it was. <laughs> uh, so this was a hydrogen alpha telescope. So you are looking at the hydrogen on the sun. So you can see those prominences around the outer edge. It looks really nice. Some activity on the sun while it's being covered up by the moon. Pretty, pretty cool. Um, and right here we have our staff out on the front lawn, kind of, and all of our visitors kind of just looking at the sun. Pretty, pretty fun. Did you guys have a good time at that event? It was a great time. Yeah, yeah. yeah I had a fun time. It was really fun. <laughs> I'll unmute myself. I'm muting in between, so sorry about that audience of, or at, at home audience on YouTube, but I've been giving feedback. So um, Anyway, one of the, fun, the most fun things was taking a colander and holding it up, and all the holes in the colander made little tiny images of the sun. All of them were little crescents. It was yeah. really neat. Yeah. It was also cool to feel the temperature change. As, as the moon mm -hmm. eclipsed the sun, the temperature got colder and colder and then warm back up as the sun came back out. It was yeah. significantly yeah. darker. I was very yeah. happy with it. It was almost like a uh, totality, but definitely not nearly as cool. <laughs> yeah, not uh, as cool. But, uh, you know, so here at the observatory, we saw about 70% coverage uh, of the sun. But if you were to be in the path of annularity, this is what you would see. Uh, wow. So this is a photo taken by one of our telescope demonstrators, Anthony Perkick. Uh, he was in uh, not Colorado, Beaver, Utah, when he took this image. 
And we also have David Pinsky's images, uh, one of our museum guides. You can see the whole thing right next to each other. So this is the path of annularity. You can see here, there's still a ring around the moon there. You can't, it's not completely covered. And that's because this is an annular eclipse. So there's different types of eclipses. This one is, it has that ring because the moon is actually too far away. So it's farther away than the moon would be during a total eclipse, which means that it's closer, bigger in our from our perspective, of course. So coming up this year, we do have a total solar eclipse. It is going through the United States, so we don't have to travel too far to see it, which is very exciting. And uh, the next one that hits the United States is not going to be until 2033. So, and it's only going to be over a small section of, uh, of uh, Alaska. So now is the time to go look at a uh, total solar eclipse. And here at the observatory, the foundation uh, actually has two spots left, only two, for wow. the Mexico Great. trip. So, yeah. very exciting. Texas is sold out. Sold out. Yeah. So, if you still want to go on this trip and see the total solar eclipse, you still have a chance uh, the, with the Griffith Observatory Foundation. So yeah. If you want to go to Texas and see me there, I'm leading the Texas trip, you'll have to just watch us. You could wave at us from afar. But <laughs> plan on the next one because these are some amazing trips our foundation has put together. Definitely. Very exciting. Yeah. But uh, just so you see the difference between the annular and the total, here is another image by David Pinsky of the total solar wow. eclipse. You can see it's completely covered. You can even see some of those prominences on the side without a hydrogen alpha telescope. So Now, what exciting. is this sort of ghostly, wispy stuff we're seeing for yeah, our audience? So that is the corona of the sun. So those are uh, basically it's a lot hotter than the rest of the sun. We still don't 100% know why. Uh, but you can see that when the sun is completely covered with the moon. So look for it uh, in this yeah. total solar eclipse. Yeah. And it's about as bright as the full moon, so you don't, you know, you don't need any special equipment to see this. It's really amazing. Yeah, yeah. With the annular, you couldn't see that at all, but here you can see all of that detail, and you don't need to use any special uh, equipment. But after this point, you do definitely need to wear solar glasses. So make sure you have somebody experienced with you uh, when you're there at the eclipse, because it's yeah. important. To yeah. Well, there's there's apps you can get that'll mm -hmm. have countdowns and warn you yeah. that the yeah. the moon will be off of blocking the mm -hmm. sun in three, two, once those countdowns. It's mm -hmm. The technology is really great these yeah. days. Yeah, just make sure you're careful. It's also yeah. cool to look around while the eclipse is happening because yes. the night sky appears in the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can well, it's like a dusk sky. It doesn't yeah. get super dark. But the weird thing about it is this twilight is in all directions around you. It's mm -hmm. not off to the direction the sun is towards sunset or sunrise. It's everywhere except overhead. So it's mm -hmm. freakish. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's it's weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So look out for the planets too while you're looking at it. Try yeah. to find them. Planets, nice to bright them. stars, yeah. things like that. Very fun. Yeah, so a lot of people will ask us, so why do these eclipses happen? And you saw that there's differences in the types of eclipses, and all of that happens because the moon's orbit is very, very complicated. So there's a lot of different types of, of months, actually. It's not just one month, guys. You know, you, you've been told it's just one month, but uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the different ones. So sidereal month, this is what everybody thinks the month is. So if you think... What is a month? It's when the moon goes around the sun once, or around the earth once, right? Uh, so here it is. You go around 360 degrees. Let's go all the way around. There's the little moon all the way around, and it's back to the same spot, and the earth moved forward in its orbit. Uh, so that is a sidereal month. So that's going around the earth once, 360 degrees. Um, so the synodic month is what you might be familiar with. So when the phases of the moon all pass. So when you full moon to full moon. So when you go out, you see the full moon, come back and see the next full moon. It's been about 20, it's been 29 days, 12 hours, 44 minutes, and three seconds. You have to memorize that number. There's three a seconds. Later. <laughs> Don't yes. get it wrong. <laughs> So this happens because it's different than the sidereal month because of the angle uh, that we see the moon at. So here you see the, the, the moon is just to the side of the Earth, uh, and it's going to go all the way around. Pretend like it went all the way around 
but it didn't just move all the way around. The Earth moved forward. So the angle between the uh, moon and the, uh, and the sun is a little bit different compared to the Earth. I had little marks on there that showed you the angle difference, but they kind of didn't show up. Did, That's okay. Did you move the Earth down? Yes. Yeah, so we're looking from the south. Oh, my, yes. Yes. That's okay. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, yes. Keeps us um, on our toes. <laughs> So there's also something called the anomalistic month, which is the, uh, remember how I said that the annular eclipse is the moon was too far away, uh, and this one is too close. Uh, so this is the distance. So the orbit of the moon is not perfectly spherical. It actually is a little bit oblong. So sometimes the moon will be a little bit closer and a little bit farther away. Uh, so that little egg shape, it's not really egg, but like that little oblong shape will actually wobble a little bit too. So the time between each each um, close, what we call perigee, uh, when it's closest to the, uh, to the Earth, uh, is different uh, than the, uh, the other one where it goes all the way around. The, the, its total orbit, the sidereal orbit. Sorry about that. Uh, so that is, again, uh, very different amount of time. So there's one more, one more type of month. Uh, it's, oh, sorry, I didn't show you the image. So this is the, the wobble of the, uh, the egg-shaped orbit. Yeah. And there's one more type of month, uh, and that is the draconic month. So this one is 27 days, 5 hours, 5 minutes, and 36 seconds. Uh, so this has to do with the tilt of the orbit of the moon versus the what we call the ecliptic plane. So if you look out into the sky, look at the sun, the sun travels a, a very specific place in the sky, and you can draw a line between all those, and if you imagine a plane going through the Earth uh, where it crosses, uh, that is the, uh, the, set, the uh, ecliptic line. So there's an angle between the ecliptic and the path that the moon travels, um, and where they meet up is called a node. And at those node, nodes, a dragon lives there, and it eats the moon. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why it's called the Draconic Month. It's a myth. Uh, there's no actual dragon. Sorry. Is that a dragon's name Ella by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> it might be. <laughs> uh, so, so, yeah, so at those nodes, the moon and the sun are actually in the same place in our sky. So that is where you get the points where you could actually have a solar eclipse. Uh, so all four of those, or all those months have to actually line up with each other and be perfectly aligned to make sure that you can see an eclipse. It has to be at the right distance and all of that. So that's where we get our, to our solar eclipses from. And they, there's something called the sorrow cycle, and it's basically multiplying all of those until you get the same number. It's kind of like the LCD, if you remember all that fraction math. But it's The LCD lot. sorrow system? <laughs> Yeah, kind of. Like. Anyway, a few people out there got that joke. <laughs> but, yeah, so that is what's going to happen uh, for the total solar eclipse in uh, April. So that kind of brings me to another point. We do have another type of event coming up here at Griffith mm -hmm. Observatory uh, with the moon. So just the same way that every year uh, the we have the... Uh, solstices with the sun, where the sun reaches its further north point and further south point. Uh, the moon will do the same thing, but it does that every single month. Uh, so there is a point, though, every 18.6 years when that draconic uh, 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 month I told you about, that orbit will actually wobble a little bit and the angle will change. So every 18.6 years, you get a great lunar standstill. Uh, so the moon is actually going to be further south in the sky than the winter solstice sun, and further north in the sky than the uh, summer solstice sun. So we will have a few events here at Griffith Observatory uh, to actually watch that happen. So if you're interested in seeing some of the uh, geometry of it, this is what it kind of looks like. Uh, but we actually have lines at Griffith Observatory to show you where the greatest lunar standstill it happens and the minor lunar standstill. So we'll mm -hmm. be having events for that coming up uh, during this year, so that's pretty yeah. exciting. Has anybody in the audience seen those gray lines out there and wondered what they were? Mm. Well, you can check, take a look at them <laughs> when you go out there. A few people yeah. in the audience have, but take a look at them when you leave today. You can go to the Sunset Terrace that's out there and look at the lines, yeah. and you'll, you'll know that you can come back to one of our events and actually watch the moon set along those lines. It'll right be, on that line, yeah. yeah. If you've ever been here for a solstice event, it's really amazing. It lands right on the line. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> it's very exciting. Yeah. 
All right, so um, on that note of eclipses and moons and all that, we do have a couple of lunar eclipses coming up this year. So we have a very exciting penumbral eclipse coming up. And if you don't know what that is, penumbral, you may not even know it's happening, to be honest. So um, <laughs> there is a regular lunar eclipse where you're going to be right in the center of that umbra, which is the darkest part of the shadow of the of the, uh, of the, the Earth. Um, so the outer edge is a little bit less dark. It's not quite as good. If you've ever seen outside, we ever go outside, uh, you stand in the sun, midday sun, and you look down at your shadow, there's a really deep shadow part, and then there's sort of the edges that are not quite as deep. And that's what's happening here. So the moon is going to be in the penumbra, and it's not going to touch the umbra. So you will see it darken just a little tiny bit. So pay really, really close attention on uh, March 24th, really late at night. And you might see the moon get a little bit darker, uh, but it is not going to turn red the way it does for full uh, lunar eclipses. Yeah. So, yeah. If you were on the moon looking up towards the sun, the mm -hmm. earth would be partially blocking the sun. You'd be seeing a partial solar eclipse, which mm -hmm. is why it's a penumbral eclipse. So the two kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely uh, full umbral eclipses of the moon are much nicer. So... Do try to find it, though. It's kind of fun. And we, and we don't have any of those. This we year. don't have a full one, but we do have a partial one uh, where the moon, the moon is going to get a little, little tiny piece uh, bitten out of it in the corner. Uh, but, yeah, it's not going to be super exciting. It's going to be very short. Um, so that's what we have. Uh, so looking forward at the meteor showers this year, we do have a few of them that are going to be pretty good. So the uh, Eta Aquarius, uh, their moon is going to set, uh, it, so it's not going to disrupt observations. It's very small, so 30 to 50 meteors per hour, very exciting. Go out to a dark sky site because around here you'll maybe get like two meteors per hour, so <laughs> not nearly as good. Uh, the Southern Aquarius, uh, this one's also going to be pretty good. 13% waning crescent moon, so check that one out. Uh, this one, yes. And we have the Perseids coming up. This one is going to be pretty good. 47% waxing crescent moon, uh, 100 meteors per hour. We love the Perseids around here. Um, and waxing crescent's good because it sets early. Yes, very good, yeah. yeah. And you, you want to see these meteors usually like 1 a.m., 2 a.m. Yeah. That's when you're going to catch the most. Definitely, that's when their peak is usually. Yeah, so, uh, oh, I don't know. So there, was a, uh, there are some meteor showers that are not quite going to be as good, uh, unfortunately. So um, the Geminids, we, the Geminids usually have like 150 meteors per hour, uh, and they're unfortunately going to be blocked by the full moon. So uh, we won't be able to see that very well. Uh, they're not in there. It's okay. Yeah. Um, so... That's pretty much what we have today for the upcoming astronomical events. But well, anything else? does anybody have any questions about them in our audience here? No? Yeah. Excellent. Well, um, we have a video here to celebrate um, a lot of the guests we had. We've had some amazing guests in, at All Space Considered over the years. And 2023 was a really, really special year. Um, we ended the year, of course, with Nobel Prize winner um, Dr. Kip Thorne and artist Leah Halloran. Um, a fantastic program. I recommend you check that out online. There might, there probably isn't still copies of the book in the gift shop. They signed some of those for the folks that are in the audience here. But you could ask. You're muted. See, oh, I'm still muted. <laughs> um, Normally, he puts a thing up on the thing, a sign up. Anyway, so thank you. Um, but anyway, what I was saying is our, our guests last year were really terrific to our, our YouTube audience who could barely hear me. And there might still be some copies of the book that they had that are signed by Kip Thorne and Leah Halloran. So it was really pretty special. And we'll have more guests coming up in 2024. Um, but we don't have any to announce quite yet. But the Europa Clipper team came here, um, had sort of a party here to celebrate the fact the spacecraft was basically finished being built and it was being shipped off to do the final testing. And they wanted to have a celebration with all the scientists and whatnot. They came here, looked through our telescopes, saw a planetarium show, just had a good evening. And then they told us, hey, if you want some speakers, let us know. We'll come talk. So we're going to get some Europa Clipper people to come here and talk That'd in 2024. So. It'll be a lot of fun. But let's take a look back at um, some of the speakers we had in 2023. Oh. I'm pretty sure we all have something in common, which is that at some point in your life, maybe recently, maybe when you were a child, you were outside on a clear, dark night, looking up at the sky, and you started wondering, do any of those stars have planets? The easy answer is, if it's around a star, 
then it's a planet. <laughs> and if it's floating out in space on its own, then it's a brown dwarf. Thinking rationally about the world and viewing the world rationally is important. Apart from all the fact that it is just joyful. Do any of those planets have creatures on them? Looking up in their sky, maybe even looking back at the sun, looking at me. How a comet appears largely depends on where the Earth is with respect to the comet. For example, you can, with a little bit of planning, you can pick out the International Space Station. I had my own imposter thoughts. I mean, I was a, the only African-American woman in a field dominated by white men. I, at the time when I went back to grad school, I was over 10 years older than my peers. And I was a classically trained actor. This particular image right here in red, this is taken by the Spitzer Space Telescope, which looks in infrared light. And again, we keep zooming and keep zooming. I just really want to emphasize look how many stars there are. So I would go to Leah with some mental pictures that are closely tied to my research and say, Leah, can you paint this? And mm -hmm. <laughs> Leah takes off from that and she turns it into something magnificently beautiful that captures what I had intuitively in my mind anyway, but captures it ever so much better. One way of thinking of this is if you look at a table with a glass cover and it has a little bit of dust on it, you can't see the dust very well if you're looking at it from a high angle, but if you go down to the level of the table and look along the top of the table, the dust looks very thick and it's easy to see. Oh no, I didn't clean that. But... <laughs> The universe has different ideas. Most of Australia is a desert. It's a very dry place. If you live in the desert, you see in the sky snakes, reptiles, birds, where if you live on the coast, you'll see stingrays and sharks. There's a painting of colliding neutron stars, yeah. and I had made one that I really loved, and Kip said, there's a new computer simulation. You need to make <laughs> another one, and I was like, it, no. it doesn't look <laughs> it doesn't look quite like what you're, you're And then painting. of course I did it. I think it's empowering to have a better understanding of science. If you haven't gotten it, get it. Finally, we are here at our final zoom. We're looking at the very heart here. Ah, oh my god! And that's it. I'm done. I'm done. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight for All Space Considered. Um, I want to thank everybody that made All Space Considered possible throughout 2023 and also tonight. All these folks that are listed um, made import important contributions to this show. Um, I want to thank you, Vanessa, you, Alan, for the show tonight, all our techs. Um, it was a great program. So thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>